uh, at the course. Uh, good evening as well if you're joining us on YouTube, as I know uh, a number of people did last week. Uh, last week we, we looked at the nativity story in Matthew, for which I referred to as the uh, punk version. Uh, this week I referred to the Luke version as the Beatles version, so who else better? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. but, and we could have planned this, couldn't we? Who else better than, than Charlie uh, to talk about the nativity in, in Luke? So uh, as we start, um, let's just uh, we'll just say a, a prayer. This is one of the uh, readings from Night Prayer, which always makes me smile, bearing in mind it is from Night Prayer. Keep awake. <laughs> For you don't know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, or at cockcrow or at dawn, or else he might find you asleep when he comes suddenly. And what I say to you all is, keep away. Well, I'm sure we're going to be able to keep away <laughs> with Charlie speaking on Luke. So, over to Charlie. Thank, Thank you, sir. That's great. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah, welcome to everybody, and, and yeah, welcome to everyone out there on YouTube as well. Good to have you with us. So, we'll uh, what we're going to do tonight, we're going to have a, a, a little bit through um, Gospels and what Gospels mean, a little bit about the Bible and what the Bible means, then we'll go into Nativity, looking at Luke, and hopefully we'll get through it all in an hour. So, first of all, first slide. Everything's got slides, 47 slides, so if we spend a minute on each, we should be, should be all right. So, first slide, please, Corin. <laughs> oh, I've got the clicker. Sorry. <laughs> what do I do? Which one? <laughs> oh, look at that. Brilliant. Okay. So, this is my recipe for spaghetti carbonara. Um, lots of people will do it differently. Um, I've been to places all over the world where they cook it. Um, the, the best place I've had it in is in Rome, and in Rome they use something called guanciale, and it, I think it gives it a nice taste. If you go down to Zizi's, they'll have mushrooms in it, and cream, which I don't think carbonara should ever have mushrooms or cream in. Sometimes they'll put garlic in it, um, <laughs> but whichever way you cook it, that would be your ingredients for, for a spaghetti carbonara. This is um, ingredients for chow mein. So a lot of you like chow mein, I, I quite like chow mein. This is how I would sort of cook chow mein, depending on what's in the fridge, of course. Um, but that, those would be my, my basic ingredients if I was cooking chow mein. So you've got carbonara and you've got chow mein. And they're different meals cooked by cooks in different ways. And um, if we were then to look at Matthew's Gospel, he has ingredients for his gospel. This is the way he's cooking his gospel, putting this stuff into the recipe that makes Matthew. And specifically, we're talking about the nativity, the birth stories. And so you've got these things, and Sam went through these. Thanks, Sam, last week. And he talked about Joseph, you know, how Joseph, lots of figures in, in Matthew prefit, um, look at prefigurement in the Old Testament. So Joseph dreams dreams in Matthew's nativity as in the same way as Joseph in the Old Testament dreams dreams and so you've got that Old Testament New Testament kind of thing that, that Matthew kind of likes and you remember he quotes the Old Testament all the time Matthew this is to fulfill what was said through and he goes through he, he compares how Jesus like like the Old Testament that's what that's the ingredients for his gospel that's what he's cooking up if you go to Luke you get a very very different story a completely different story you get the story as almost through the eyes of Mary. So it's Mary who has the angel of it. So when we have Joseph, 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 now you've got Mary, Mary, Mary. So it's a, com it's a completely different meal, if you like. A completely different meal. Lots of different things uh, about the story. Um, Mary and Joseph, in Luke's gospel, Mary and Joseph have a, have, have a house in, in Nazareth. In Matthew's Gospel, they live in Bethlehem. So you've got different things going on in different places. And, 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 and this is all important. And so in, in Luke's Gospel, we'll see the, the shepherds come to, to see Jesus. In, in Matthew's Gospel, the Magi come to see 
Jesus. Now, these ingredients are there for a reason. They're there for, if you were to get carbonara and you were to mix it up with the ingredients of chow mein, you wouldn't get a better meal. You'd, you'd just get a mess. It would be like a dog's breakfast. And so we've got to be really, really careful because uh, this is the, this was the nativity scene I saw in Milton Keynes. And you've got, here in this scene, you've got shepherds on the left with the sheep. You've got an angel kneeling down with the baby. And you've got the manger on the right. It never happened. It never happened. There was never a time when the shepherds and the magi were together in a stable. Of course, the problem is, we've all taken part in nativities. We've all been asked to be, you know, an angel. Or I was, I was, I was, a, I was a wise man um, when I was when I was little. I've still got a key ring with my picture in the bottom of it. You can look at it like that. You can see just about make me out with my with my present that I was bringing to Jesus. But it never happened. Now there are some bits. Uh, oh, just a jumbling to ruin the recipe. And same way, you got carbonara and chow mein, mess it up. You, you can actually lose the meal that Luke has cooked and lose the meal that Matthew's cooked. Does that make sense? So, jumbling up the ingredients. They do have some things that are the same. There are some common features, but there's much less than you would actually think. And uh, the names of the parents of Mary and Joseph. Um, yeah, in, the gospel, in both Gospels, that's the same. Joseph was a descendant from David, that's true. An angel tells Jesus' birth, true. Mary was a virgin when she was conceived, sort of. We'll come to that. Uh, Jesus was born in Bethlehem, yeah. Herod the great king of Israel, and Jesus found himself in Nazareth. Those are all things that are, that are in both Gospels. But there's lots of stuff that they disagree on. Lots and lots of stuff. Um, I've said that, you know, Matthew has this Old Testament kind of thing, you know, Herod's like there, and Joseph's like Joseph, all that kind of stuff. Um, in, in Luke's Gospel, it, it's gonna, we're going to look at Luke's Gospel tonight and see it's very different. Luke's got some things that he wants you to, to know about Jesus, which are only in his Gospel, and he wants to stress those things. Because, I mean, he's like, um, he's like a chef, and he wants to cook up a meal for you, and he wants you to taste that meal and, and understand what he's getting at through that. And that's what we're going to look at tonight, so the, the themes that are in in Luke's Gospel. Now, this is an interesting question. It's not just about the nativity, it's about the Bible as a whole. How do you think the Bible was written? And what kind of books are the Gospels? And this is a really, really important question. You see, Muslims believe that Muhammad was not able to write. So God kind of dictated what he wanted to be in the Quran, and then Muhammad got people to write it down. So it was literally the word of God. Literally the word of God. And it's a miracle how it's brought about. What, how do you think the people who wrote the Bible wrote the Bible? And in what way, when we say they were inspired, in what way were they inspired? Because this creates all kinds of problems. Because some people say, well, look, you know, I read the Bible, there's contradictions. There's contradictions. And if God wrote it, or, you know, people were just like typewriting, you know, just typewriting, there wouldn't be any differences. So, you know, in, in bits where it says that, you know, Judas went and hung himself and bought the field in one place, and then another place it said that the, 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 the richest authorities bought the field. Who's right and who's wrong? Or if, if it says um, in, in one gospel, Jesus cleansed the temple at the beginning of his ministry, and the, uh, another gospel says at the end of his ministry, who's right and who's wrong? And, and we've got to think in our heads. How do we reconcile the, the differences in the Bible and the way in which one is written this way and one is written in that way? And how much input is there from a human point of view in what is in the Bible? When we say it's infallible, I, you know, uh, what do we mean by that? It's infallible. You know, when the, in Genesis when it says the Bible is written in seven days, does it mean seven days? And does it, mean, does it want you to believe it was seven days even? Or is it just saying, you know, there were periods of time in which the Bible was written? So we, we, we're, we're actually searching after the truth. And Sam and I were just reflecting before the meeting tonight that, you know, at the moment, we are confused. Because we have scientists who only deal with the truth. And one scientist is saying 
Actually, you shouldn't be vaccinating 30 year olds. You should be vaccinating the 60 year olds. Get all the 60 year olds done because they're the vulnerable ones. You don't bother with the young ones. Just get all these old ones done first. Another load of scientists say, actually, we've got to start getting young people done because they're infecting everybody. So you've got scientists who completely disagree about the way in which we should be managing the vaccination process for COVID. And Sam and I said, that's just like the Avengers. Just like the Avengers. I've, I've just bought two brand new commentaries on Luke by really clever people. <laughs> really, really, really clever people. One commentary is actually written by two people. Two really, really clever people. And they've written it together. And they both have a different point of view. And as they're going through the commentary, they're saying, Ben says this, and AJ says this. So they're disagreeing in their own commentary about what, about what it means. I don't think there's anything wrong in that at all. I actually like that because it shows that they're gra 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 grasping at the truth and wrestling with the truth as they go through because a lot of stuff we just don't know. And it would be a lot better if we just admitted that and said, well, we're all searching after the truth and, and you might actually come out with that and I might come out with this. And I suspect that we will do that tonight because the Gospels are works of faith and they're there to inspire faith. And they're not written in the same way as, as we have history books now. For the Gospel writers, the chronology was not important. In the same way as it's important today, when we say history, we mean, well, I want to know what we know, what order it happened. Well, the gospel writers aren't writing like that. So we've got to look at those books of faith. And each, I've said it, each gospel writer is trying to tell us how a Jewish builder from Nazareth ended up turning the world upside down. And that's what the gospels are about. And they're trying to do that in a, in a work, in a, in, a, in a meal that they're cooking up for us. Now, when we look at the nativity stories, there's going to be a lot of stuff that people disagree on. A lot of stuff. And it really, really doesn't matter. Because the nativity stories, the birth of Jesus, included in two Gospels, Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke are the ones where we learn about the birth and childhood of Jesus. And they're written in the last 20 years of the first century. Matthew and Luke. That's the only place that we get the stories about, you know, the Harry Joseph, all that kind of stuff. Mark, which was the earliest gospel written perhaps 65 AD, no mention, no mention at all. John's gospel, no mention at all. Now, Mark's gospel was copied by Luke and Matthew. Huge, huge chunks of Mark I just kind of taken out and stuck into Matthew Luke. They also read it. So Matthew was the earliest gospel going around inspiring people's faith and he wasn't at all interested in the nativity. And some people said, well, well why, was, why did the later gospels put the nativity stories in at all? Uh, and people have reflected on this. Some people think um, it might have been because people were doubting you know, whether Jesus was properly human. Uh, Mark's she was around a bit, a bit later on where they tried to tackle um, heresies that were going on. So they, they put these stories in to try and... Um, for Jesus as being born a human being and as a human mother, because some people said he's just kind of like you know, materialized. Um, so there are lots of different, lots of different questions. The Apostle Paul, and you all know Paul, the most, the most significant um, person after Jesus in terms of our faith, the Apostle Paul, um, he, and he wrote earlier than Mark. He wrote his epistles earlier than Mark. This was the, the first material that was, that was circulating around it doesn't mention Jesus being born in a special way. So it's clearly not central to belief as far as Paul is concerned. In fact, Paul was eager to emphasize that Jesus was a blood descendant of David. He wrote that, that Jesus was descended from David according to the flesh. So the single most important person after Jesus, not a mention, not a mention. So if you believe one thing about the city and I believe another thing about the city, I really don't think it's gonna matter because it didn't matter to Paul. One thing I would say, and this is interesting, there are no manuscripts of Luke 
which don't include the Christmas nativity stories. So it's not as if we've got a later version, because some, some people say, it, it sounds like Luke could begin at, at, at chapter three. He could just begin it at chapter three and leave out nativity stuff. But actually there's no manuscripts that we've got that write it out, and, and, and that's just worth remembering. Let's tackle, first of all, this, the thorny problem. It always is a thorny problem. Can anyone tell me who, who these people are? Who, 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 who are they? The quiz, quiz. Can you see that at home on YouTube? I hope you can. Oh, perhaps you can. Right. If you can't, you'll have to go online and we'll, and we'll, we'll put it online afterwards. If, see if you can get any of them. Any of them? Corinne, you can get one of them. <laughs> well, you've got uh, the She Wolf, Romulus and Remus. Yes, the She Wolf, Romulus and Remus. Thank you. That's the one in the middle, yeah. at lower middle. That's Cyrus. Cyrus. We got her? Cyrus. Cyrus. Cyrus, no. Osiris. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, said Cyrus. Cyrus. No, yes, no. yes, yes. Um, you should get the one on the bottom on the right. Yeah. Which country? Egypt. 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 Oh. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, okay. So it, it, it's Isis and Horus on the left. Uh, on the top in the middle, you've got Attis. The bottom, yes, Romulus and Remus from the founders of Rome. Top right, Plato. And the bottom right, rather, Sun God. And what is common to all of them? What is common to all of them? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I'm glad to see you taking it seriously tonight. Uh, no, it's good. They're dead. They're, they're all subject to virgin births. Also, think the better. I mean, we could have had the others in as well. Um, lots of people uh, previous to Jesus. These were all previous to Jesus. And just the dates: um, Attis, twelve fifty BC, Romans and Remus, well, a long time before Jesus. Plato, Plato, long time before Jesus. Rather, so all, all before, all before Jesus, all before Jesus. So the idea that special people were born of virgins was fixed in people's minds. You, you know, if someone was you know, really important, was born of a virgin. I mean, Caesar, you know, the, the really important people didn't have normal births. Um, and the reason I say this is because for a long, long time, it was thought that the touchstone for Christian orthodoxy and belief, and whether you were a sound Christian or not, was whether or not you believed in the virgin birth. And I think we've just shown that 25 out of the 27 books in the New Testament say nothing about the virgin birth. And, and it was quite sad because in 1987, someone called Jane Shepo, a former nun, um, wrote uh, uh, her work in which she questioned the virgin birth and she had death threats from Christians, you know. Um, some see the virgin birth as a touchstone for orthodoxy. For other people, for other Christians, they see the virgin birth as just actually a copying of Greco-Roman myths. And you've got to hold together those two views. And I think you can legitimately be a Christian and, and believe both. Um, some Christians believe they're being more devout because they recognize the background, the milieu in which these stories formed. Um, so it, it's for you to decide. Um, Matthew uh, uses the term uh, virgin when he's quoting from Isaiah, but it's a it's a mistranslation of the of the Hebrew by the Septuagint about two two hundred years BC, because the original Hebrew said a woman of marriageable age, not a virgin. Now <clears throat> that's compounded by the fact that in Matthew's Gospel he does say that you know they didn't have sex before Jesus was born. So you know that that's, he makes it quite clear in that respect. Was he working from a false premise? I don't know. I think as we go through Luke's Gospel, you'll see that. Um, you can read Luke's gospel and still believe that um, there was no virgin birth at all. Because it doesn't say that Mary, that, uh, Mary and Joseph didn't have a relationship before Jesus was born, sexual one. So it's an interesting question, this. Um, and I'm not trying to undermine faith, but what I am doing is opening all of our collective consciousness to the fact that there's lots of views out there about nativity stories and where they are. And it's important to be aware of them. Um, lots of people um, go to theological college to train, and in their first year they lose their faith. Because all of a sudden, they're, they're being exposed to ideas that their, their, their ministers haven't told them about. 
And that's not good. So one of the th good, good things about an advent course and these kinds of sessions that we can have is that we can look at things honestly and recognize the issues and uh, even not at all to, to weaken our faith, but perhaps to strengthen our faith. Um, I think it's important. So um, in Luke's Gospel, Mary questions how she'll have a child. Since a man I have known not, uh, it's, it's a possible reading that, that her virginity remains in place, but not a necessary one. Not a necessary one. So it's about faith. So let's just uh, whip on. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll just show you. You can see them all there. Uh, all the different people. Um, cracking on. I should have shown you these slides. I was too busy talking. Um, that's just. And, um, and that's just my, my summary of, I think, where we are in Luke's Gospel. If you want to believe in a virgin birth, you can. If you don't believe in a virgin birth, you can. It's a matter for you and your faith to decide what you think is right. Uh, so just some very brief facts about Luke before we get into it. Um, starts off with a dedication like a work of a Greek literature. This one called Theophilus means God-lover. Um, Sam says it's like the Beatles. I think it's a bit more like the classics. Um, it's a bit more like classical music. Um, but there you are. Um, it's a high level of Greek, much more literary than, 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 than you'll get in other Gospels. Uh, he claims to have eyewitnesses. <clears throat> Was Mary an eyewitness? Um, you know, who, who, who would have told Luke that Mary had a, a, you know, a, a visitation of some kind? I, I, I don't know, really. Um, we, we'll, I'll mention it perhaps a little bit later on, but one of the commentaries that I was reading is uh, there's a, 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 a guy called Ben Witherington, who, who's one of the authors of it, who's a very evangelical, um, conservative uh, Christian theologian, I would say. And, um, and, and he was open to the idea that Mary might have written it herself, which I found staggering. Um, but certainly she could have been an eyewitness. Um, uh, use Mark's Gospel, I've said that. Um, and he writes to, what he's doing is he's setting up Rome and Jesus. The imperial authority of Rome and how Jesus challenges it. That's what he's going to do in his gospel. So he takes phrases that have been attributed to Caesar, like saviour, son of God, bringer of peace, hope and good news. These were all things that were already being said of somebody else. So when the words are spoken to Mary, these are ideas that were already around about Caesar. That's what he's doing. And, and you, you show that basically he's anti-imperial. He's anti-authority. He's anti um, the structures which were oppressing the Christian people. And they probably would have been pretty severe at that time. Remember what happened to the Christians and, and the destruction in AD 70 of the temple. So in Luke, what have we got? Uh, a lovely picture by Marilla. Um, in Luke, there's no star. There's no Magi. No Herod, no Lord, no Egypt. So when in Matthew's Gospel, Mary and Joseph escape to Egypt. That doesn't happen in Luke's Gospel. Instead, they go to the temple. Jesus is circumcised, and they go back to Nazareth. So the whole bit of Egypt is missing. Now, if Mary was an eyewitness, wouldn't she have said, well, have we oh, by the way, we also went to Egypt? He doesn't put that in. I don't know why. So Luke says, after eight days, they took Jesus to the temple for circumcision. Uh, do you know how hard it is to get a, a, a photograph of circumcision that you can actually use? It's <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, another. Uh, I think that there are actually Muslims who are doing that, because, of course, uh, circumcision comes from Genesis. So in Genesis 15, Abraham's told to circumcise. Um, Muslims are descendants, aren't they, of... Abraham, in exactly the same way as Jews are, they practice circumcision. So I think that they might be Muslims. I don't know. But after eight days, they do this circumcision, and um, and that's, that photograph has a star rating on Wiki Commons. It's meant to be one of the best available. Um, so uh, so there you go. Uh, the two stories. We begin in the temple. That's where Zechariah has his vision, 
Remember, we, we looked at this a few sermons ago, and I said, I wonder what wonderful it'd be to be gay, to be able to shut people up. Um, Zechariah was told that he was going to have John the Baptist. Um, baby, and this is, this is important stuff because sometimes people say, Luke's gospel, it's not very Jewish, it's, more, it's much more Gentile. But actually, Luke says a lot about the temple. A lot about the temple, if you look at it. It starts in the temple, the stories, with Zechariah, and it finishes in the temple. In chapter 24, it says the disciples were in the temple continually. So the temple features really importantly in, in the Gospels. And this is, uh, this is the temple. If you go to Israel today, the best things that you will see are the ruins of what Herod the Great did. Um, Masada, the temple, things like that. They're all stuff from Herod the Great. He, he was a horrible man because he killed everybody, but he was also an incredible architect, uh, a builder, a man with great um, ability, which is why the Romans let him be called king, because he didn't do that very easily. Um, but one of the things he did was to build a temple, and, and this temple was really important in Luke's gospel, and, it, and that's why it, it, it's important to remember Jesus being taken there, um, the offering being made, remember Mary and Joseph take Jesus to the temple, they do the offering of the, 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 the pigeons and doves. That was a poor person's offering. That helps us because we know that Mary and Joseph weren't rich. They were when they went to the temple. Um, th this is the contrast that we have between Matthew's gospel and Luke's gospel. In Matthew's gospel, a couple are living in, in Bethlehem. In Luke's gospel, you have Mary, Mary and Joseph in Nazareth. Um, and they have to travel to get to Bethlehem because, of course, that's where the Messiah is going to be born. And, and they, 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 they travel because of the, the instruction that there's going to be a census, a worldwide census. Um, uh, there we go. Uh, this is a little picture of Harry. Um, oh, more information about Harry. Um, this is the stuff I was telling you about a few moments ago. Um, Masada, I mentioned the temple. Caesarea, absolutely wonderful port, wonderful port, brutally cruel, horrible person. That's Henry the Great. He lived from 30, and this is important, he lived from 34 to 4 BC. Remember this, 34 to 4 BC. Uh, and we're told that the reason why Mary and Joseph travelled from Nazareth down to Bethlehem was because this um, census was decreed that all the world should be registered, the first registration, and it was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. That's a lovely mosaic from the 14th century. Um, the, 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 the problem is, well, there's lots of problems. Uh, Quirinius was appointed legate of Syria by 6 AD. So you've got Herod dying in 4 BC, <laughs> and then you've got Quirinius doesn't become the governor until 6 AD. So you've got a period of 10 years. Does that make sense? Then? So you can see the dates don't work, do they? Now, if you were believing that the Bible was written in the way that the Quran, I'm not ridiculing the Quran in any shape or form, please don't misunderstand me, but there's a difference of interpretation of the way in which it's written. That's all I'm saying. Or if you believe that the Bible was literally written as a typewriter, you might have a problem now. You might actually feel that your faith was being shaken because... Oh my goodness, there's 10 years missing. Now, I don't find that particularly problematic. In fact, the fact that there's changes in details in some bits of the so what that actually makes me think that it's not just all concocted, it's not all just made up. So I, I'm quite happy with some eyewitness details being a little bit different. But lots of Christians aren't, of course. And some people will go through hoops to try and explain how you can have Herod dying at 4 BC, Corinthians at 6 AD, and, and match the two up. Um, so, censuses were forbidden under Jewish law. They triggered the revolt of Judas of Galilee, and who, who formed the party known as the Zealots. And Luke would have known that because in Acts, a little bit later on, I think Acts 5, is Acts 5, he talks about that quite clearly. And um, so, this census is, is a bit new, isn't it? And the whole world being taken part in the census. Is doesn't really strike true. So there's something wrong there, we don't quite know what. And as I say, theologians can't agree. But what we have got is this pro this problem. Matthew clearly written while Herod is alive, he dies in 4 BC, Matthew's nativity, and Luke written when Quirinius was governor from 6 AD. A slight problem. 
with the dates. We go on to the next slide. It, uh, it shows you at the top there, and you can see Nazareth right at the top, just to the left of Lake Galilee. And it shows that poor old Mary and Joseph had to go all the way down to Jerusalem and then to Bethlehem, about 70 miles. So, did I say down? It's up. It's up. They go up. And, uh, and then, of course, in Matthew's Gospel, afterwards they go up to Egypt. Whereas in Luke's Gospel, he makes no mention of that. Did they go there and they just forgot to mention it? I don't know. Who knows? Who knows? Here's an interesting one in Luke's Gospel. Some interesting details. Um, this is the first one. We all know the Tiffany stories where Mary and Joseph go to the inn and they knock on the door and they say, Can we come into the inn? And the innkeeper always oh, goes, No, we have no room! And it's just, it's just a thing. Um, I mean, you've all seen that. It's, 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 it's classic. Um, it, 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 the word used is not an inn. The word used is not an inn. Um, it does not mean inn. And some Jews have become very angry about this because it says it. It shows a lack of Jewish hospitality, which would never have taken place. Uh, it's anti-Semitic. So they say our nativity place is anti-Semitic because we're ridiculing Jewish hospitality, which we should never do. Uh, a cataluma uh, means a guest room, not an inn or a stable. And in fact, we got a perfect example of that because later in Luke's Gospel in 22, 11, Jesus says, where is the guest room, cataluma? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. So exactly the same word for, which we translate as in, means a guest room to Jesus when he's looking for a place to celebrate the Passover. Does that make sense? Yep. Uh, you're, all, you're all with me. Um, so where was this? Where was this Cataluma? And some people have suggested it might have been Joseph's uh, home, family home, where the guest room in the back. And of course, in those days, why waste the heat from the animals? Um, so you could have animals living in, you know, sort of domestic, a domestic environment. Um, it, it's an interesting question, but certainly when we see in an innkeeper, we should be respectful of our Jewish friends and know that that is not something which is a good translation of scripture. It's just, it's just bad theology. So some interesting details from Luke, carrying on this um, theme. Here's, a, here's an interesting one. The angel, I don't know if you can see that at home, um, on YouTube, so I'm gonna, I'll read it out. Uh, I've got a picture on the left of someone called uh, Miriam. Now we're told that the angel Gabriel sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. Now we translate the word, the virgin's name was Mary, um, uh, 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 as Mary, but actually it's not Mary, it's Mariam in the Greek. It's Mariam. So Mariam becomes translated to us as Mary. Now the problem with that is it misses an important echo. And the echo which I think it misses is, is that Moses' sister was Miriam. And she was the leader of Israel. She was a singer of songs, uh, especially at the salvation of Israel at the Red Sea. Um, I've got two little passages from Micah which are on the, which are on the screen. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam. That's from Micah 6, 4. And then uh, the prophet Miriam, Aaron's sister, took a tambourine in her hand and all the women went out after her with tambourines. They were singing and dancing, singing to the Lord. That's from Exodus 15, celebrating the freedom of the people. And uh, it's just interesting that why we would translate it, as you, as you can almost call her Susan. You know, it's just, there's no kind of thing there. There's no correlation. But there is a correlation with, with Miriam. And there's lots about Mary's life, which is an echo of her. And, and we'll move on to the next thing which I want to bring out, which, which is important. And that's the equality of women. I remember being in a lecture and, um, and, and being asked by this very clever professor, the whole room, you know, what were the themes of Luke's gospel? And I remember vividly, I mean, I was only um, a young London graduate, and uh, what did I know? But I remember the, the, the people saying very simple things. And I said, well, he's got a bias towards women. And I, I remember vividly kind of looked at me as if to say, what? <laughs> bias towards women? There is a definite bias towards women in Luke's gospel. 
really important one, and, and I was pleased to read in one of the commentaries that I've just bought that, uh, that they, they agree with this too. When you have people like Elizabeth, when you have, uh, who's, um, who gives birth to John the Baptist, when you have people like, because you have Zechariah, but you have Elizabeth, um, then you go to the temple, you've got uh, Simeon, but you've also got Anna, who's a prophetess. Um, let me move on to the next slide. Um, and you can pick up some of these things as I'm talking about them. Luke says women provided for Jesus out of his, out of their own means. It's Luke's gospel that tells us that women funded Jesus' ministry. That's how he, he got the money to do it. It's Luke's gospel which tells us about women at the burial of Jesus. It's Luke's gospel which emphasizes that there were male and female disciples. And you've got a whole load of other stuff about people like Mary and Martha and what Women are really important. And that's why I think it's important that you get the contrast at the beginning between Joseph in Matthew's gospel, you know, it's all about the boys, and, L and Mary in Luke's gospel. But actually, it's about an important woman here. Uh, and it's quite interesting looking at, um, looking at the way Miriam was treated. Uh, if you know the story of Miriam, uh, the, the sister of Moses, uh, Miriam and Aaron, Aaron is Moses' brother, question Moses and what he's doing with um, his relationships. And, uh, and Aaron gets off scot-free and Miriam kind of gets, you know, punished um, because she's a woman. Um, and and there's, there's this a very interesting change that comes about in Luke's gospel where women are elevated in a way that they're not in, in other gospels and perhaps haven't been since. Another really important um, theme in Luke's gospel is God's care for the poor. And this comes out in the TV. How long have we got? How are we doing for time um, Folks, 22. 22. Oh Lord. Okay, we're fine. We're fine. We're fine. <laughs> so, this is important. God cares for the poor. How's this in the nativity? Well, the fact that there are shepherds who come to see Jesus, not Magi. I mean, that's just a, a very obvious one. Now, it's quite interesting when you when you read the theologians about shepherds, because some theologians will say shepherds were on a level with um, thieves. And robbers. That's what shepherds were like. And other commentators will say, well, actually, you know, Moses was a shepherd. Uh, David was a shepherd. So they couldn't be that bad, could they? Um, other people say, well, because they were in the fields, they couldn't go to synagogue, so they were unclean. Other people said, they weren't unclean. So it's, there's a, quite an interesting dynamic that goes on when you read clever theologians at the same time, right at the same time, both with different views. They, they, they disagree. But what they do agree with is this, that they're workers. They're workers. And if you lived at the time of Jesus and you were a worker, you were fundamentally poor and exploited. You, you know, you, you've got, if you think of 100% of the population, 95 of them are on the breadline. 95% are on the breadline. You know, it was hard. It was hard living. No, no kind of social state to pick you up or anything. So they were in the they were in the category of worker. They were they were they were poor. So that they weren't magi turning up with gold and frankincense and myrrh and being admitted to Herod's palace. These were people who lived in the fields. And so Luke says it was people who lived in the fields. It was the poor who came to worship Jesus, not Herod and his minions or any of those rich characters. That's a really important point that he wants to make. It was, it was about the poor. The next slide, really important. This is about the poor. Mary and the Magnificat. What is this? What a charter of civil rights. You know, this, is, this, is, this is Mary, the belligerent, like Miriam, you know, a woman with some gumption, but the Magnificat. I mean, there are, there are places where apparently it's been banned, you know, because it's seen as being too politically outrageous. Um, I, 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 and there are places in the world where this needs, frankly, to be spoken. Um, I was listening to Jeffrey John talking about this, and he was, he was talking about, about in terms of, um, I think he was, he was using the pop group, Pussy Riot, who got locked up and what have you, using the Magnificat. And, and the church in Russia wouldn't support them because, of course, they're in hock to, to, to Putin and his characters. But this is Mary talking about salvation 
Not in terms of going to heaven. Not in terms of going to heaven. This is in, in, in terms about human liberation. And she, she uses the past tense, the aorist tense. They're not talking about a future thing that God's going to, you know, let people go to heaven or what have you. She's talking about change here and now. God is bringing about change here and now. He's chosen the poor. He's chosen. He's chosen her. And, and of course, how does a young girl of marriageable age get to come out of something like this? It's been compared with the songs of uh, a song of Hannah from the Old Testament. There are other parts as well, various psalms, which have got bits of this in it. So it's it's kind of drawing out of the Old Testament themes which are important, which Luke has, has, has emphasized. And I've just gone through there with some bits in yellow, which I think correspond quite nicely with, with the Magnificat. So this is words kind of spoken hundred years beforehand. And she says, my heart exalts in the Lord, my strength is exalted in my God. You can kind of get the feel of it, yes? Makes, makes sense? So it's very much about change. And of course, in Luke's Gospel, he goes on to talk about the emphasis on the poor. In Matthew's Gospel, it says, blessed are the poor in spirit. In Luke's Gospel, it says, blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor. And uh, so it's not just about a spiritual kind of thing. Um, Matthew has fulfillment passages. You know, Jesus did this to fulfill what was in the Old Testament. Luke has freedom songs. Uh, if I had to choose the gospel, I'd choose Luke's. Because it's very grounded in the here and now. It's very much about where people are. Really important. Uh, the poor and the lost will be liberated. I put dead chairs at the bottom there in brackets. That was just to... <laughs> that, that was just to remind myself that... that um, it's not just about the rich becoming poor and the poor becoming rich. That's just changing the deck chairs, isn't it? Um, what she's talking about is change, that there will be liberation, there will be freedom. And that was really important. Uh, another theme um, in Luke's Gospel, God's care for the lost. God's care for the lost. And this comes out throughout the Gospel. And, and I think this part of, of the nativity of God's emphasis on the poor, the weak, um, and, and, and it's, it's quite interesting that the prodigal son and the good Samaritan are only in Luke. Those are my two favourite parables. Uh, perhaps my favourite part of the whole Bible. Um, the, the, the good Samaritan. I mean, it's just absolutely magical as a, as a parable. If you, if, you, if you read the context in which it's, in which it's written. Um, you know, how, how do I, you know, I read it anyway? You, you all know it. But look at the context. It's, it's really good. And the next scene. The, I'll, I'm going to finish off on this. Uh, I think we've only got a few pages which we can, which we can look at. The, the, the final thing is that it's full of joy, the Nativity, and Luke. It's full of joy. And so when you when the angel announces the birth of the shepherds, he says, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. Joy is a word which stands out throughout the whole of the Nativity episode. When... Um, when Zechariah is being uh, spoken to, and this is the same as we did Zechariah and, and, and Elizabeth, do not be afraid, Zechariah, your prayer has been heard, your wife Elizabeth will bear your son, and you will name him John. You will have joy, and many will rejoice at his birth. It's all about joy. It's not about fear. It's not about frightening. John isn't coming to, 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 to make people be afraid. He's coming here to tell the good news of who's coming after him, which is Jesus. And when Mary and Elizabeth meet with one another, for as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leapt for joy. That's John. Leaping for joy in the womb. And Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God my Saviour. This is all good news. So compare it. Now, don't think about Caesar and his good news. Think about Jesus and his good news and what he's going to bring. And the change that that's going to bring. Think about, uh, about the happiness that will result. And then, finally, just some other little pieces about, about John. This will be the last slide. Lost sheep. There is rejoicing over the lost sheep. There is rejoicing over the lost coin. There is rejoicing over the sinner who repents. These are all things that are in Luke's gospel and the joy that comes. And that comes out of the nativity and spreads into the gospel. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven, and it's joy in heaven, over one sinner who repents, there are 99 righteous people who need no repentance. And that's again Luke. So if we take anything away from tonight, it's that 
We've got to be really careful about acknowledging that none of us has all the truth. We've got to be really careful in making sure that we read the gospel on the terms in which it was written and not ruin the meal. And if we do that, these important themes from Luke's gospel should stand out and hit us. The, the importance of caring for the poor, the lost. God favouring those who think actually that they're not of very much worth. And ultimately taking great joy because that's what the nativity is really all about. Thanks ever so much, everyone. <laughs>
the Bible is what you're asking, isn't it? Yes, and, and, and I think we have to be really careful. I mean, the classic one is, um, well, well, not a classic one, but a classic one would be um, Jericho, you know? So, um, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. And the walls came to him now. And, and we teach these stories. And, um, and we forget that Jericho ended up with genocide. And they went in and they killed all the women and the children and the animals. Um, so I don't want to ever make out that something was God's will when I think it was just cruel, barbaric seizing of other people's property. Um, so I think we've got to be really careful when we teach children these stories. David and Goliath, you know, chopped up his head. Well, you know, perhaps, was, perhaps he could chop off his head, but, no, but we, we do need to be very careful what we tell children. Because we don't want to mislead them in any way. And, um, and some parts of the Bible are quite cruel and, and, and nasty. And I, I'm not a child, I'm not a, an educator, I'm not a teacher, so I, I've got to really be very, very careful what I say. But I do think we need to be honest. You know, should, should we be telling children, well, actually, there weren't shepherds and kings at the same time, should we not have but them? I don't it, it matters that much whether they were shepherds and kings at the same time, just that you need to know that it didn't happen. Yeah. Um, and, and we do need to, to tell them that shepherds were ordinary people. Mm. And, you know, that, that therefore, if they're ordinary people, that they, they matter. That, that's it. These are important things, aren't they, for, for us to teach them in some in, in junior church. That, that, that ordinary people matter to God, um, that he, he wasn't just interested in you know, rich people or in, you know, really clever people, it was just ordinary people who worked with their hands, that you know, Jesus was just a builder. Um, he lived in a very ordinary town of perhaps 500 people in a, a fairly, um, very rural setting, um, and probably eked out a, a fairly poor existence as he was growing up. You know, be honest with, with children, and I think that honesty it will help. Right, I think we're ready for our are we ready for our refreshments? So it's it's time for fellowship, folks. <laughs> Can we just say the grace together? The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Share our recipes of